So the next two Sundays we have uh, my dad that's going to be speaking for us. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, that will be, you'll enjoy that with, as I, I know I will. I know that uh, um, this, this week we had a great week at SYC. We saw a lot of decisions and uh, um, I know this next week is going to be, just, it's, it's going to be better because it's not going to be raining, I hope. But uh, I've never seen so many mosquitoes in all my life. And then we, as we drove by the sign at the Alliance Church in, uh, in Alber- at Alberta Beach, it said, why didn't God just let Noah slap those, those two mosquitoes? And uh, I had to agree with them. So, but anyways, um, I'm going to ask my dad to come now, and he's going to share with you what God's placed upon his heart. Is that better? Can you hear me now? You have to turn me up quite loud because I'm not young like my son anymore. <laughs> it's echoing a little high. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to the book of Galatians with me this morning, and we'll find our text there and my reading as well. I want to go to the second chapter of Galatians and um, begin at verse 16 to 21. And we'll find my text in there, 16 to 21. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, therefore Christ, uh, is Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For though the law, or through rather the law, I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, Lord, we are thankful that so many have gathered and come out. And we pray, Lord, that as we read and study in the Word today, that it will leave a a massive impression upon us that our lives will be indeed changed, that we may look upon ourselves differently than we have ever looked before. And we pray, Father, that you, Lord, would touch us in a very, very special way and that we would go from this place changed and rejoicing for having been here. And Father, be with us, your speaker, today. Give him the words to speak to this good company to be for us today. We thank you for them. We thank you for you yourself and what you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. Father, I especially appreciate the music this morning. It really truly does lead up to what we're going to talk about today. And we thank you for the, those who participated and the ability to sing along with them. Again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My text is found in the 20th verse of this reading this morning. And it simply says this, and the part I want to look at is, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. The title of my message is Crucified Christians. I want to thank you before I begin, though, for allowing me to come once again here. And I haven't spoke to my son in, in, in a message in I don't know how long, because he's been away for some time, and it's a pleasure to be able to do this, so... And indeed, it's a pleasure to come here. This, to me, is one of the finest churches I can possibly come to to preach. And uh, having had something to do with it, I even like it even more. So uh, I want to begin by saying the Christian life is the noblest and happiest life that a person can live. But one thing we need to know about it is it's no bed of roses No holiday journey. Once you enter the life, it is a battle from that day forward. Once you are there, you cannot rest and will not rest until you reach the haven of heaven. It is a demanding life. To be lived rightly means a full surrender and to the will of God. 
If I invited you to become a Christian and told you that the Christian life is a long, sweet song, I'm deceiving you. How many people have found that being a Christian is an easy task? When I was a younger person, they used to tell me the only reason that I was a Christian is because I had no backbone, no spine, couldn't stand up for myself, and had to lean upon this Christ that I revered so dearly and loved so greatly. And yet I want you to know that the Christian life is a difficult thing. Yet I would rather fight a good fight of faith and endure the toils along the way, having Christ as my daily portion, and find a place in heaven with him at the end of the way, than to go along all of my life without him. There was a period of time in my life where I had turned my back upon the church. I would have nothing to do it, my, with it. My father had passed away. And for some reason at that time, and do I think to a lack of maturity, I turned my back on the church, blaming God for absolutely everything that had gone wrong. But you know, as I met a wife, my wife, she turned my thoughts around and changed my life to the point where I realized the gravity of my mistake, the wrongness of what I was doing, and turned back and rededicated my life to Christ. And praise God, he has never deserted me. He has been with me all of that time, ever since, and he's been with me throughout the time of my, my dedication to him. Having him then as my daily portion has been magnificent. To enjoy, I suppose I could have went on, enjoyed all the fruits of sin, to gain the whole world, and come to an internal death at the end of the way. The text says, I am crucified with Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean to you and what should it mean to me? I am crucified with Christ. We know what it meant to Christ to be crucified. We see a cross on a hill far away and hanging on that cross is the Son of God dying not for his sin, of his own sin, but dying for others. The sun goes down behind the clouds and we hear the cry. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We see him as his head bows and he gives up the ghost and we hear another cry. A cry of victory in my mind. It is finished. We hear the words of the poet and he says this, See from his head his hands and feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorn compose so such a crown? I understand that. I know what it means for Christ to be crucified. When Paul says, I am crucified, what did he mean? He was not there. He did not hang on the cross. What does it mean when he says, I am crucified? Crucifixion. No other way literally meant death. There is no escaping it. If we are crucified, we are dead in our own lives. If we, like Paul, we are dead to sin, to the old life, to the old lust, to the old self, and to all of our old ambitions. We take a stand over here with Christ, and we say to the sinful and worldly things over there, so far as you are concerned, I am dead. You have no more power over me. You cannot have any over my dead body. Paul is saying a great thing here. He did not reach that standard, though, in a day or in a month. It was a long, hard process, and it will be hard for you and I. I would be really remiss not to reinforce the fact that the Christian life is difficult. Well, you say, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't go here, you can't go there. But I want you to know that if you are crucified, as Paul was crucified, and live the type of uh, life that Paul lived, 
you soon would find that you would have no desire to do some of the things that once was at the very seat of your heart. You're changed. To know Christ really makes a difference in one's life. And that's exactly what he is saying here. God help us to say, I am crucified with Christ. Here, there, here is the secret of being able to say that. Listen to the last part of the verse. It says, Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. All things are possible to us if he is a living reality reigning on the throne of our hearts. I want us to note that thought. I want you to think about that as we go on. But first this morning, let me say a Christian's feet ought to be crucified. Jesus' feet were crucified. They crossed his feet, and I want you to picture him on that cross over there. They crossed his feet over there, and he drove the nails into his feet and through his feet until the blood and the bones were broken. Can you imagine the agony in all of that. Our feet should be crucified too. And what do we mean by crucified feet? Well, we must be careful where they take us. Never let them lead us into a place with dishonor in him. Our feet are crucified and we will be following his wounded footsteps. One night as he washed his disciples' feet, he wants us, I believe, to have the same kind of clean feet. They ought to never walk in the slimy places of this old world. But in the, on the contrary, they ought to go on in errands of mercy. They ought to carry us to those who are needy and poor and lost. We are to use our feet in Christian service, offering help and salvation to all our fellow men. But now that means missions. Well, Christ wants the gospel to go to all the ends of the earth. Some feet must go to take that message. And I ask, would you do it? This morning, would you carry the gospel message to the furthest ends of the world? And you may say, well, pastor, you know, I'm not really called to be a missionary. Well, would you be willing then to help someone else to go in your stead? Are you going to do that? Are you helping in God's great redemptive program for the whole world? You know, Mercury, part of that pantheon of gods in Rome, was the messenger of the gods. His feet was winged. We are messengers of the Heavenly Father. If we are crucified with Christ, our feet will never take us where sin allurement is. But it takes us on many errands of mercy in the name of the king. The hymn writer wrote, take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful just for thee. That's ought to be describing us. Secondly, a Christian's hands ought to be crucified. Jesus' hands were crucified. They were stretched out upon that cross member of the, on the cross in agony and blood, they were nailed there. Every time I talk about this, I just cannot begin to imagine the agony that was involved in the crucifixion. The death, how it carried on and on and on and on and seemed like it was never going to end. But you know, our God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, could lay his life down any time and pick it up again which he was to prove three days hence from this. But we need to see, but what he went through, the agony that he suffered whilst he was up there on that cross, is beyond compare. Back in that upper room, after this all was over, he showed his disciples his hands, and Thomas looked upon the prince of the nails, and he cried out, My Lord, my God, if our hands are crucified, we want to be able or be careful of what we handle in life. There should be never think anything in our hands that's going to stain or do things that are wrong. The blessed pierced hands of Jesus were 
laid upon suffering human beings to bless them? Can you imagine Jesus holding anything sinful in those hands? If you want to be like him, you be, need to be careful what your hands handle. Jesus' hands would never hold anything that tainted, was tainted by dishonesty. I will tell you what he wants you to do with your hands. You are to labor by giving a good day's work. And then you are to take the money that you earn. And I think we need to lay it aside, some of it, for the work of God in our day. You know, this is where the rubber really hits the road, isn't it? You know, when you begin to dip into your own pocket and say, well, do I have to give something? One of the hardest things I believe that ever happened to me as a Christian was learning to tithe. When we were first joined with the First Baptist Church that I was a part of, my wife informed me, of all of a sudden, you know, we've got to tithe. I said, what are you talking about, tithing? I own half the world my paycheck. And the other half I got to eat with. I don't have any money to give anybody. But you know something? I did give a tithe. And I still give a tithe. And it's not painful at all, people, if you soon begin to realize that it's, this is something that you out of joy can give back to the Lord for what he has given to you. Amen? This is a joy, folks. And that's what I believe that we ought to be doing. We need to look upon what we can be doing to help in this manner. Oh, we are to be crucified Christians. Our hands ought to be dead to sin and wrong. They ought to be active in the service of the King of Kings because Christ is living in us. I'd also say to you this morning, uh, Christians' ears ought to be crucified. Rather strange thought, is it not? If our ears are crucified, we will be careful about the things to which we listen to. There are voices all around us, voices that tempt us downward, but if we are His, we will not listen to these voices. Some of these voices are Sunday voices. And they say to us, don't go to God's house. You have to, many things to do. You've been busy all week. It's now a time to rest and have a good time. How many times have you woke up in the morning? I woke up this morning, I get up very early if I have to preach. Four o'clock it was, I think. And I thought to myself, you know, I could just sleep for a while. It won't matter. I've been looking at this sermon for so long that I think it's grown on the inside of my mind, but it's not there. I could never get up here on a Sunday morning and feel comfortable about anything. I'm frightened to death to stand here before you. It was one of the hardest things in the world for me was to overcome my fear of people and the ability to speak. But you know, stay home. Do this thing or the other thing. I want you to know that's the voice of the devil talking to you. The crucified Christian must not listen to him. Some of these voices are weekday voices. They shall say, pull a shady deal. Make more money. Follow the path of circumstance. Forget what the preacher said on Sunday. You must look out for yourself. You ever had vo voices like that speaking in your head? Yet yeah, we must be deaf to all of these. They come from Satan and they lure us to the gates of hell. Crucified ears do not listen to gossip and the things that hurt others. The one who listens is almost as bad as the one who tells. There are many who lap up gossip with their ears as a cat laps, laps up milk with its tongue. They have itching ears. They want to hear something detrimental about someone else. They should never hear it from a crucified Christian, I would say to you today. I have never read that Jesus listened to gossip about anyone. You have better things to do. You and I have better things to do with ourselves. You know, when someone begins to speak badly about someone else, what ought we to do? We can't close our ears, but we certainly can walk away from that person, can we not? 
If we have crucified ears, we are not going to listen to the likes of that. If we are crucified Christians, we will say, I am deaf to all that that is wrong and hurtful. Christ liveth in me. You must agree with me that Christian eyes should be crucified. Isaiah was talking about Jesus when he said his visage was marred more than any other man. On the cross, his face must have been battered beyond recognition. They pressed the crown of thorn upon his face. It pierced his eyebrows, and the blood literally run down his face. And yes, his eyes had become crucified. If our eyes are to be crucified, we must be careful what they look at. There are so many things today that make an appeal to the eye. And though the eye is the doorway to the lower passions of our lives, the world uses color and light to lure us downward. For the proof of this, have you ever stood before a, a bookcase full of magazines? Wholesome things, aren't they? My wife gets these ladies' magazines. I wonder what they are for. Some of those things those people wear today are just unbelievable. Makes me blush. We need to throw them away. You and I, and I talk to the ladies as well as would talk to a man, we need to turn our eyes away from the likes of that. The motto of a certain preacher, a radio preacher that I used to listen to quite frequently on a Sunday morning when I was preparing to come to church, his motto was to keep looking up. Just keep looking up. We are to look up for his coming. If we remember that he is coming to reward us, according to our works, we will be busy for him. Our eyes will look out upon the needs of the world. We will see that the fields are white on to the harvest, and we will not be content until we are gathering this harvest for him. In the book of Hebrews is a phrase. It says, looking on to Jesus, this is, the, the, this is the best use that the world has for its eyes. We can look to many people. I enjoyed your singing this morning. Your group up there. I, I, I wanted to make mention of this sometime today that I truly enjoyed it. It was just down to earth where I think I'm walking around. I don't have no notions about myself, but I loved it. So I just wanted to tell you that. But we're to be looking on, not to people like that get up and give of their times and do a marvelous job, but, but we're to look where? We're to look on to Jesus. From there we will get our encouragement, our uplifting, to go forth and do those things which are pleasing unto him and not unto the world. Use our eyes to detect what he indeed would have us to be doing. We need to look to Christ and he will take care of all of our needs. And we do a need to keep looking up for the upward look will lift our lives toward God. Next, a Christian tongue should be crucified. James has some very practical things to say about the tongue. He says you can put bits in the mouths of horses and turn them, but you cannot turn the tongue. A mighty little beast, isn't it? You can turn a great ship in its course by a very small rudder, but not so with the tongue. He tells us that a fire is a destructive thing, but the tongue burns quicker than any other flame. He tells us that we can tame all manner of beasts, but the tongue cannot be tamed. Now if we use the, our tongues for him, we will never wag them, but necessarily. My father used to say to me, gossiping, a gossiping tongue is tied in the middle and it flops on both ends. It does double duty for us. Here is a prayer I believe for all of us, and we ought to pray it. Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut. There are times when we shouldn't talk, isn't there? Many times we should just keep to ourselves 
And it is there where we will get the power and the ability to do what we need to do with our mouths, with our eyes, with our body, when we are looking and trying to find a place in God's kingdom for us. I've seen things happen in a church. I was part of a church. It's one of our own churches. One tongue started to wag, then another and another. Soon the tongue, or the church rather, was split into, split into pieces. The work was hurt. The people were divided. The young people left the church and went into the world. And while the devil laughed with glee, Job has a, a formula for us that says this in Job 6, 24. Teach me to hold my tongue. We say, well, you know, what's a little gossip among friends? What's a little conversation when we can talk about somebody jo and just joshingly say things about them? But you know, we hear somebody say something bitter in, in early in the week and a week later it's still burning us and bothering us. And yet it was all supposedly done in fun and it can't be done that way. We need to ensure that our tongue is crucified for Jesus Christ. And finally, a Christian's heart should be crucified. Jesus' heart was crucified. Some say that he died of a broken heart, and no wonder. The scripture tells us that he came on to his own, and his own received him not. The sin of the world was upon him, and even God's back was turned for a time being from him. And as he died, they thrust a spear in his side, and water and blood gushed forth. Yes, his heart was crucified. The question we need to ask ourselves, is our hearts crucified? Is it dead to sin and evil? Is it a throne upon which he lives? Does he have first place in your life? Or is your heart divided between the world and Jesus? In Britain, an old Saxon, Saxon warrior united with the church and came forward to be baptized. He told the minister to immerse every part of him except one hand. But he was told that the whole body had to be buried with Christ. That he needed to be totally immersed in the waters of baptism. And he said, no. He said, I want to keep one hand out so that I can slay my enemies and fight with them to defend our country, myself, and anything else I so to desire. He's like so many people in the world today. We want to give a portion of ourselves, our body, to the work of God, give ourselves to Christ, but we want to remain in control of a portion of our lives and use them for our own delight and for our own purpose. But beloved, when we become crucified and our hearts are crucified to Christ, we give it totally and completely unto Him and in no other way, amen? It can't be partially ours and partially his. We must be totally and completely involved and given over to Jesus Christ. Let us be big people and have the right attitude. Let us love others regardless of what we think and what we ourselves are about. If your heart is crucified, you're going to have the right attitude. And the question is, when we receive Christ, how did we receive him? Many people today do want to have a portion for themselves. But we must surrender completely and totally to Jesus. Some of you may grow older and feel God's call upon your life. You cannot go partially. You know, one of the biggest things is to surrender your life to ministry and wholeheartedly. Well, you say, I haven't been called. We're all called to something. God has a purpose for each and every one of us here today. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're going or what you do in life. You can be doing the meanest job in the world or you can have the grandest occupation. But a surrender to Christ is going to be the best thing that will ever occur to you, will ever happen to you. You cannot be so overly educated that you cannot humble yourself to
totally and completely to him. Will you do that? Are you willing to do that? I recall in my own ministry, someone said, you know, I believe that God is calling you into ministry. And all I could say to them, you're totally mad. You know, not me. In fact, I remember the first sermon I ever preached, it was absolutely horrifying. I carried so many notes into the pulpit, I tell you, I had to have an extra bag to carry them with me. And I set them up on the pulpit, and the pulpit groaned. And I was ready to really rock the building. It took me five minutes, and I was done. <laughs> but I tell you what, in all the years that have ensued, God has been with me. And the joy that I know and I understand is no matter what he calls me to do, like Paul, he walks right alongside of me. He's there, encouraging me all the way. Some of you may become missionaries. Frightening, isn't it? To go to some foreign country and share the gospel of Jesus Christ the world over, or wherever God may call you. It may be right here in your own back steps. But if we have crucified hearts, if we have truly surrendered our lives unto him, the burden is not so terrible. In fact, it is quite light, very delightful, and very rewarding. We don't have to wait to get home to heaven to start to enjoy the rewards of, of Christianity and being crucified to Christ. No, sir. We can begin to do it right now at this place, right, and enjoy it to the fullest. God help us to live and hide behind the cross that people may say of us. These things come from his life, not because of his personality or his ability or learning, because he has been to Calvary and has had, had a touch from Jesus. And I say to you today, in all sincerity, we need to go there together today. Let us leave, and you may think that I'm ridiculing, but I'm not. Sin clings to us still. Paul said that he had the will and the desire to do that which was right. And yet there was something within him that fought the goodness and the desire to do that which was right before God. In other words, there was a revolt ongoing. And I don't claim to be a Paul, but I certainly can know that there is that kind of association in my life. There is an ongoing struggle with what is called the old man. It's in our lives, all of us. And I pray today that as we crucify ourselves to Jesus Christ, we'll overcome that kind of thing and live for the better and greater glory of Jesus. Are you crucified? I'm crucified with Christ, Paul said. Are we? And can we say that we are too? And we're living to the best of our ability. We can live beyond the best of our ability. We can live in the ability of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Will you go and gather at the foot of the cross this morning and say, Lord, I'm not all that I can be yet, but I will be with your help. I want to surrender once again fully and completely to you. I want to do your will to the best of my belly. Will you do that? May God bless you this morning. May he keep you.